Before registering a new patron, either via the Pending Patrons interface or the Register Patron, I always want to search for my patron first, searching the entire consortium and inactive accounts. Once I confirm that my patron is not there or that there's nothing to interfere with them getting a new card at my library based on the multi-card policy, I will go to Register Patron and begin filling in the information. Barcode is specific to your library barcode range, so even if you are creating an account for internal use, an institution account, you still need to use your standard barcode range. Of course, I'm going to use a made-up barcode range in the test database. When I click in the second tab, it pre-fills for me with the same barcode, and that's true for new registrations. Um, you'll see when we update that we might have to fill that in. Now, some libraries use the last four digits of the phone number as the password, and so um, this is a random number that's pre-filled when I open the register patron screen, and once I enter the phone number, it will populate with the last four digits of, of that number if that library setting is in place, or libraries that are using something like the last four digits of the barcode, staff will need to manually copy and paste that or type it in. I want to list the full legal name of my patron. And if uh, my patron has a nickname or preferred name, uh, Robert might go by Bob, Annabelle might go by Anna, then I can put the preferred name here in the preferred name fields, or I can use the name keyword. This should be what's on the ID. If your library system has a public hold shelf, you may want to give the patron a holds alias. NC Cardinal does require a date of birth, so uh, you will want to list that. Once I fill in my patron's date of birth, if that happens to uh, be a juvenile account, or qualify based on the library setting for juvenile patrons for your library system, this box will pre-check. And if it is a juvenile account, you may want to record the parent or guardian here. Driver's license is the default identification type. There is also other that you can utilize, and you can list the number here. You may also want to use the secondary identification type. This may be useful if, for example, your juvenile patron has a driver's license because the person is a teenager. Email address is encouraged for patrons because it does allow them to receive notifications that their items are coming due. They get a notification a few days before. Um, you can also select email checkout receipts by default if they would like that. Daytime phone number may be required by your library system. And if you want to fill in evening phone number or other phone number, if your patron um, might need uh, more contact numbers listed, then uh, you're welcome to do that. Home library will automatically pre-fill with the workstation location where the staff member is logged in, uh, but you can select a different location if the patron would prefer that. The patron profile group uh, should be from the list that your library leadership provides you. This is a shorter list for the test database. Uh, there's a longer list in NC Cardinal, and not all libraries use all of the patron permission groups. So you want to be sure that you're using the ones selected by your library leadership. I'm going to choose adult for my patron. We never use secondary groups for patron accounts. This is strictly for staff accounts. The privilege expiration date automatically filled once I selected a permission group because each permission group has a default. So you can manually change that if you choose to, uh, either using the calendar widget or let's say this patron pays a fee to join your library because they don't qualify for a free card, you can shorten that date. For internet access level, uh, it automatically defaults to unfiltered for NC Cardinal. This has nothing to do with how your library may filter 
internet content for your patrons. This is used by software such as PC Reservation or other uh, manage, software that manages your public computers. So uh, if, for example, you want to give no access to juveniles who don't have approval from their parents to access the internet at the library, you can use that with rules and PC reservation. So there's no difference between filtered and unfiltered as far as Evergreen is concerned. It's external rules that may change how the patron can access the public computers. The active box is checked by default, of course, if you're Registering a new patron, you generally want that account to be active. If a patron passes away or um, has some other life change that means that they'll no longer be using their card, you can update the patron to uncheck that. BARD is used by libraries generally for patrons who are banned from the library and should not be coming into the library or accessing their account at all. It does prevent patrons from even, even logging into their account in the OPAC, so you do want to use it sparingly. There are many automated blocks that Evergreen can apply to patrons that still allows them to log into their account, but they may not be able to renew materials or place new holds. Is group lead account is a checkbox that applies if you are grouping patrons. I am going to be grouping this patron with her fictional son, so I am going to check that box since she is the adult in the group. Claims return count and claims never checked out are obviously zeroed out when you start a new account. These can uptick whenever uh, patrons make this claim and staff apply it to materials. So for instance, an item can be claims returned and if staff mark it so in the patron account, this will tick up to one. Um, you do want to be careful about clicking in here and scrolling up or down as that does affect the numbers. Alert messages here can be added. For instance, uh, let's say my patron has low vision and needs large print. Then maybe I want to put that in there so that I always get an alert when the patron asks to place a hold or something like that. That message will show for any staff member. If patron comes to the desk and you scan their card, that alert message will always show first thing and so staff will always be aware of that information. We encourage patrons to go ahead and set a default phone number for holds and a default hold pickup location. This does not pre-fill, so you will have to choose it. And so it's good to check with the patron. Sometimes they may work somewhere different than their home library, and so they may wish to pick up their hold there. For hold notifications, if there is an email address, patrons will generally get an email. These are just set by default. You can also ask the patron if they would like to get a text message for their holds. That is possible, and you would need to enter the number here and indicate the default SMS carrier. And for prepaid phones, this is not usually the retailer where the patron got the phone or the brand name. There may be an underlying carrier, and so uh, there may need to be some research to find out which carrier that is. NC Cardinal does require at least one address for patrons. It defaults to mailing address. Both boxes are checked for mailing and physical address. If you need to list another address, for instance, if the patron has a PO box and your library wants to know what the physical address is, you can change this and you can see it unchecked automatically here. That's not true for my patrons, so I'm gonna go ahead and Click the X to close out that address, and I'll put in my fictional address for my fictional patron. When you put in the zip code for an area NC Cardinal actually covers, then the city, county, and state information will actually pre-fill for you. But I'm putting my fictional patron in a non-NC Cardinal area, so um, let's see. I'm not even sure what county that is. Huh. I'm just gonna make one up. <laughs> All right, um, it automatically checks as a valid address. 
You can, uh, if it's important for you to track, whether it's within the city limits, you can also check that box. I have one statistical category here. It is not required, um, but if my patron happens to be a volunteer at the library, we can apply the statistical category. But since she's a new patron, um, she hasn't had a chance to volunteer yet. But because I did say I wanted to group this patron with a new account that I'm creating for her son, then instead of clicking on the Save button here, I'm going to click on Save and Clone. And you'll see that this patron account goes away and a new patron registration form comes up and some of the information has been pre-filled, the phone number and the mailing address. So if I fill in information for my uh, fictional uh, son, or for my patron's fictional son, I should say, then I'll quickly run through this account creation. And you see how the juvenile box was checked and I'm going to list. And then of course, if I had a driver's license number for my uh, parent patron, I would go ahead and list it there. Um, and let's just go ahead and list one. And the phone number's here, the home library is here. For this patron, I'm going to choose juvenile. And again, the privilege expiration date is filled. Uh, again, this would be set. Uh, perhaps uh, Mrs. Wentworth wants uh, little Frederick not to have access. Oh, I also was going to put in a nickname for him. And I can put it in both places, although it's not required. Then uh, I go ahead and approve the mailing address. And I'm finished grouping this patron so I can click Save. And I'm finished. Now you'll notice that it brings me back to a form. What I'll need to do now is go and search for my patron. And I'll just search, uh, I search by last name and get both of my patrons. And you can see a family linkage number here. This, uh, you don't have to keep this in the patron search results, but it does help you see that they are grouped.